Hi guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. Today's case was recommended to me by someone on Instagram and if you know who you are please comment down below because Instagram doesn't let me save the request so I just saw the name of this case and I quickly googled it and I was like how have I not talked about this case before? The name alone intrigued me and when I looked into this case I remember it so vividly and I'm shocked by the details as I read further into it. Imagine you're in your early 20s, you're a performer, you just had a gig and you had a great time. You kiss your boyfriend goodnight as you begin your walk home. It's late at night, but you have nothing to worry about. The city is filled with lights, there are people nearby, and you've done this walk a million times. You arrive at a park, you take off your shoes to feel the cold grass between your toes, and then suddenly you are thrown to the ground. This is the tragic case of Eurydice Dixon. Let's just jump in. Eurydice Jane Dixon was born on 10th of November, 1995, and her name alone is so intriguing to me. I love her name, and I think it can be pronounced, I mean, it's a name, so you can pronounce it a few different ways. Eurydice is how a lot of the media pronounces her name, but I believe she pronounced it Eurydice and her nickname was Riddy. She didn't grow up privileged and she didn't grow up with a very great start to her life. Her parents were Kate and Jeremy and she had two siblings, Christopher and Polly. As you were to see was growing up, her mother Kate struggled with a heroin addiction and when she was just seven, the police came knocking on her door and told her father Jeremy that her mother was found dead in a shopping center. She had died from a heroin overdose. Losing your mom, honestly, no matter how, you know, no matter what age, it, it honestly has to be one of the toughest things. And I really don't know how people deal with that. So at just the age of seven, you know, her siblings and her had to deal with the death of their mom, but she still had her siblings and now she was left with her father, Jeremy, to raise her. Her father, Jeremy, was a lawyer and a political activist. The family lived in a flat in the area of Parkville and this case takes place in Melbourne, Australia. And Parkville, in terms of how far it is to the city, is pretty much still in the city, but it's like on the outskirts and it would take maybe like 15 to 30 minutes to get there if you were driving or catching a tram or train, something like that. But it's a really nice area. It's a very busy area and and any area that's surrounding the CBD is quite expensive in terms of if you want to buy a property, but a lot of people rent in that area because it's close to the city. And in terms of safety, I wouldn't say the city is super unsafe, but given that, you know, people hang out in the city areas really late at night as opposed to a suburb. So I think crime rates vary. Eurydice was close to her siblings and to her father. However, the death of her mother, their mother, greatly impacted the family. Eurydice was described as brave, clever, funny, really nice to people, and she had a genuine passion for the arts. Eurydice was a born performer, according to her family, and following the death of her mother, she had to grow up pretty fast. I mean, she was seven, so she most likely would have at least understood some parts of losing her mother. She had a difficult childhood due to this. She had a tough time at school, kids would make fun of her and she dealt with bullying. However, she didn't let this stop her. She went on to study drama at Deakin University and then she worked for a local theater company. Then in 2018, Eurydice made her Melbourne International Comedy Festival debut and she had a solo stand-up show that she called At Home, I Feel Like a Tourist. Like I said, she had a genuine passion for the arts and she dabbled in many areas of it. She was an actor, a comedian, a writer. She loved being a performer. Although she would come across as shy, her family knew her as fierce. Eurydice was 22 years old. She was figuring out who she was. She was growing and learning and living her life. She was doing really well as a comedian and she had regular shows in Melbourne. And she used these comedy shows to 
express her ideas and talk about her life experiences. She was described as a passionate feminist, something that she talked about a lot, but she also made fun of herself a lot and talked about social issues and issues that women faced. Friends say she could always find something funny. Even if a joke didn't land, she could always find a way to make it funny. She was happy. She had a boyfriend, Tony Magnuson, and all was good in her life. On Tuesday, 12th June, 2018, Eurydice had just finished one of her gigs at a comedy club called the Highlander Bar. This was a regular gig and she had fun that night talking about regular issues, but making them funny. Her boyfriend, Tony, met her at the bar at 8 p.m. and then she went on to begin her set at 8.50 p.m. Her set lasted 10 minutes and at about 10.20 after all the gigs were done, Eurydice and Tony, they met some friends in the bar and then they talked for a little bit and then they left the club at about 10.30 p.m. So at this stage, Tony and Eurydice are ready to go home. And Eurydice, like I said, lived in Parkville and Tony lived in St. Kilda. And these two suburbs are in the opposite direction of each other, but not that far from each other. So they walked along Flinders Street. They walked to the tram stop. They waited for Tony's tram together. So once Tony got on his tram, Eurydice began her walk back and she walked towards Flinders Street again and she cut across Flinders Flinders Street train station. And if you don't know, that's an iconic, huge station in Melbourne. It's like the main station in Melbourne where you can catch any train from. And I believe at the time that corner that you can like cut across this corner, it's hard to explain, but I believe she cut across the corner because you can walk undercover. And then she began walking along Swanston Street. That intersection alone is super busy. It's always, always pretty busy unless it's like really late at night. But she yeah began walking down Swanson Street and that was her way home. Now walking from Flinders Street to where Eurydice lived in Parkville, Flinders Street is the main main CBD and when I googled it it takes about an hour, an hour and like five minutes. It's a far walk and you know it's not uncommon. A lot of people in the city because they're used to the city life there's no point in like waiting for a tram. You can get to the next block in the same time that you would be waiting for a tram. So it's it's known that people walk a lot in the city. And for you to see, it was the same thing. She was known to do this walk often. She would walk home and take this route no matter the time. And near her house, there was this massive park called Princess Park. And she was known to cut across the park to get home. The reason why she did this was because she loved taking off her shoes and walking barefoot through this park. So by the time her boyfriend Tony got on the tram, Eurydice began her walk at about 11.08 p.m. What Eurydice didn't know was that someone else would be joining her on this walk home for the next one hour. She would be followed and stalked by a man who did not have good intentions. This man's name was James Todd and he was 19 years old and he lived with his parents and his two brothers in Broadmeadows. Broadmeadows is pretty far from the city. I don't know exactly how far, I would would guess at least 40 minutes. And at the time, James had a girlfriend, a girlfriend that he had been dating for four years. He was undertaking a hospitality course at the Hester Hornbrook Academy in Paran and he had finished his classes at 3 p.m. that day. After he finished his classes that day, he caught a train into the city with three of his friends. He then tried to buy some alcohol, but he didn't have his ID on him, so he was denied. So he then goes to another liquor store and he was able to buy vodka and some paper for his rolling cigarettes. He hangs out in Batman Park that day, which is a park that's really close to the train station. And him and his three friends, they would all drink that bottle of vodka that he had purchased. Then after a couple of hours in the park, one of his friends decides to go home and now he's left with the two friends and they buy some cider alcohol and then some weed from some guy in the park. James and his friends then head to 7-Eleven to grab some cups so they could drink the cider and then they end up going back to the park and they drink the cider and they smoke two joints. It's now 8.30 p.m., And James and his friends, they head to Southern Cross Station, which is another big station 
in Melbourne. And over here, he ends up buying more alcohol, a bottle of Jim Beam and cola, and they hop on a train back to Broadmeadows, which is where James lives. One of his friends then gets off at Flinders Street Station, and then James then gets off at Newmarket Station, and there was one friend left on the train. James is now alone, and I'm guessing because his other friends were kind of done for the night, he still decided that he wasn't done for the night. So he then hops on another train back to Flinders Street Station, and he gets there at about 10.25 p.m. Once he's there, he walks to McDonald's, which is at the intersection of Flinders Street and Swanston Street. He goes to McDonald's, he grabs something to eat. After eating McDonald's, he walks back and now he's at that same intersection of Flinders Street and Swanston Street. As he's hanging around this area, it was then that he spotted Eurydice. So at 11.08 p.m. when she begins her walk home, she begins crossing that intersection of Flinders Street and Swanston Street. He lets her walk ahead a little bit before he begins to follow her. He keeps a constant distance of 15 to 20 seconds behind her. When she stops, he stops. He would roll a cigarette to just make his actions look innocent. If she looked around, he would hide behind large objects and pillars. On Eurydice's walk home, she crosses all major intersections. Swanson Street is like the main street and it crosses all these other main roads. Then as they're walking, they get to a pedestrian roadblock. So Eurydice takes a detour into the side street, but she emerges on a street parallel to Swanston, which is another main street called Elizabeth Street. In Melbourne, they're called streets, but they're actually massive roads. So they're not like Swanston Street is a massive road. Elizabeth Street is a massive road. So she emerges onto Elizabeth Street and James continues to follow her. They pass by this really iconic, huge market called Queen Victoria Market. They pass by the Royal Melbourne Hospital. They pass by Melbourne Uni. And then at Melbourne Uni, the last CCTV footage is captured of her and that's captured at 11.54 p.m. So she's been walking for like over 45 minutes at this point. As Eurydice is nearing closer and closer to her house, she comes across Princess Park, the park that she always cuts through to get home. So as she enters the park, she takes off her shoes like she always does to walk barefoot through the grass. As they roll into a new day, Eurydice then sends a message to her boyfriend at 12.02 a.m. through Facebook Messenger, and she says, I'm nearly home. How about you? Princess Park is comprised of six soccer pitches arranged into two rows, and each row has three pitches. The area was dimly lit. As Eurydice crossed two soccer pitches, she steps foot onto the third. James suddenly grabs her by the back of her hair and the back of her dress and threw her to the ground. He then sits on her chest with one hand on her throat. He rips her long black dress off, exposes her, rips her underwear in half. He then forcefully, digitally, Eurydice, he attempts to her again, but he cannot get an So he does things to attempt to get and Eurydice fought him. She fought her attacker. She scratched his face. He tries to stimulate himself by slapping it on Eurydice's face, but he cannot. So he starts choking her with both hands for five to 10 minutes, eventually crushing her windpipe. He left Eurydice lying on her back with her knees bent. His actions following This brutal attack are just strange. He takes her phone and he leaves the park and he walks to another train station called Royal Park Station. It's only a 15 minute walk, but he only gets there at 2.14 a.m. Keeping in mind, he attacked Eurydice just after midnight. When he gets there, he falls asleep on a bench at the train station and then he wakes up at 3.55 a.m. When he wakes up, he just begins looking through Eurydice's phone and then he uses her phone front camera to check out the injuries on his face. He then walks to a nearby bike track, takes a dump, takes off his shirt, wipes himself with it, and then leaves this dirty shirt on the bike track. While he was sleeping at the train station at about 2.50 a.m., 
a cyclist who was on his way back home from work discovered Eurydice's cold body laying on the grass. He calls triple zero immediately and attempted CPR. He tried to save her, but it was too late. James then walks back to Princess Park where by this time a crime scene had been cordoned off. As he's there, police move him along not knowing that the killer was right in front of them. James then walks back to a train station. He gets some food, a pie and a coffee. He gets on a train, gets back home at about 6.15 a.m. Back in his room, he makes various searches on his iPad. He first Googles Princess Park, which obviously comes up with a number of articles about Eurydice's body being found in the park. He then Googles strangulation and porn. He clicks on a number of links. Some of them were strangled and brutally, brutal choking till death strangled forced videos. Looks at a bunch of videos, then searches brunette girls on a porn site and then curvy emo girl. He browses four pages of results. So after he kills Eurydice, he goes home and relives what he did to Eurydice by browsing porn sites with disgusting acts. On 13th June 2018, Eurydice's autopsy was carried out. I'm going to read to you what they found. The pathologist found injuries consistent with vaginal penetration. They showed blunt force injuries to the head, torso and limbs and bruises to the right jawline, hands, right knee and leg. There was also a bruise to the forehead with an underlying hemorrhage. The findings which were relevant to the cause of death included bruises to both sides of her neck, abrasions of the lower front of the neck, bruising to the muscles of the neck and hemorrhage adjacent to the left hyoid bone, which is like the bone right here. And the cause of death was unsurprisingly found to be compression of the neck causing asphyxiation or possible reflex cardiac arrest. Semen was detected on the perineum and from two areas on the front of Eurydice's dress. Um, I don't think that's from him. Um, I mean, this is graphic, but I don't think it's from him finishing. I think it's when he was attempting to assault her. This was a serious, violent attack and the offender was dangerous. He needed to be caught right away. The police really went straight to work. The crime was horrific and it scared Melbourne. The rat that Eurydice took on her way home was surrounded by CCTV cameras. It's the middle of the city. So there were a ton of shops, a ton of street surveillance, and they tracked her using these cameras. Early on in the footage, Eurydice seemed fine. She had done this walk, like I said, a million times. The police asked anyone who had been in that area of the CBD between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. to come forward as they might have seen something that was important. One thing the police noticed was that everywhere Eurydice was, there was also another man. They didn't know who this man was. So the police released a CCTV still image of this man and they asked him to come forward and they wanted to speak to him. One thing that the police did that went under public scrutiny was that they, you know, during the statements, they basically said that everyone should be aware of their own personal security. And people felt like the public felt like this was putting the burden on the victims, the burden of proof on the victims. The premier of Victoria at the time, Daniel Andrews, he also released a statement that basically criticizing the police's statement, saying that Eurydice was being responsible. She was paying attention. She sent a text to her boyfriend when she was nearly home to let him know that, you know, she's nearly home. She was keeping people aware of her location and she did the right things. 10,000 women, men, and children gathered at Princess Park to honor and remember Eurydice. The more that news of her tragic death spread, the more tributes poured in for her. The park lights were turned off at 6 p.m. and candles were lit for Eurydice to illuminate the entire park. Back at James's house at 6.34 p.m., a 
a friend of his calls him to let him know that he was on the news. James then calls the Broad Meadows police station, which is the police station near his home, and he lets them know that it's him on the news, but that he knew nothing about a death and he didn't kill Eurydice. The police then tell him to come down to the station, which he agrees to, and he arrives at the police station at about 8.30 p.m. and he comes with his girlfriend and her mother as they drive him down there. When he's at the police station, his girlfriend's mother kind of learns about what James is being questioned about and he tells him to ask his mother to also join them at the police station and then soon James's mother also comes down. James is interviewed and he maintains his innocence through 660 questions but he gives three conflicting alibis. He had multiple scratches on his face which he tells the police were inflicted by his cat but the police were obviously not convinced by this. He stated that that night he went to the city, he had a bit to drink, and then he smoked some weed, and then the night became a bit of a blur. That he caught all those different trains, then he walked down Swanston Street, and then down Elizabeth Street, and then he asked someone for directions. Oh, that someone was Eurydice, by the way. And Eurydice tells him how to get to the zoo. He goes to the zoo area and then he fell asleep at the Royal Park train station, which is next to the zoo. And then when he woke up, everyone began telling him that he was on the news. The detective then begins to tell him about the forensic process. He tells him, you know, we can take some DNA of yours. We can compare it to the DNA found at the crime scene. And James stops and he says, don't worry about the DNA. I did it. I'll tell you everything. The police then look into his background and they discover that his living conditions were described as careless and filthy. The kitchen floor was so bad that half of it had crumbled. The toilet was clogged. There was trash and debris that filled every room. The house also had a number of animals present and when asked if his mother's depression was the reason why it was this way, James simply stated that the house had always been this way. And this played a role in why James would prefer to sleep anywhere but at his house, in parks, in train stations. As a child, he was diagnosed with mild autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. He would display repetitive behavior and laser-like focus on interests such as dinosaurs and things like that. At the age of 12, his school actually referred him onto mental health services because they were increasingly concerned with his emotional well-being and his social interactions. His trial took place in April 2019. During the trial, the court heard that that night wasn't the first night that James had accessed porn websites and material like that. James had been having fantasies of violent sexual encounters and killings. He had engaged in similar sexual activities with an ex-girlfriend, sexual partner, but after she didn't like it, he never tried it again. But his online search history showed that he was looking for something even more violent. He wanted to be a restaurateur by day, but at night he would watch snuff porn, which please do not Google that like I did. He would also love to watch coercive sex videos. Now, snuff porn is basically porn or sex acts where the woman dies at the end. I don't know if it's real or not. I don't even want to know. Like, and porn is a whole other issue on its own. We could make a whole other video about that. But he was obsessed with porn this type of porn, and he wanted to experience it in real life. When he was in prison awaiting trial, he actually told his father he was very disappointed by the way that the crime took place and he felt like shit immediately after it. He hoped it would be better next time. What makes this case a little different is that usually male perpetrators that attack women, they usually hate their moms, their sisters, their aunties, you know, women in general. The evidence before the court suggested that James didn't kill Eurydice because he hated women. He didn't kill her because he was taught not to respect women. His mother, his girlfriend, his female friends stated that despite his dysfunctional upbringing and home life, 
He treated women with kindness. There was never any violence in any of his relationships, but then he also fantasized about raping and choking them to death. The court found that the murder of Eurydice was driven by a rare sexual sadism disorder that is found almost exclusively in violent sexual offenders. But then I think the question we can ask is, how can a violent, sadistic rapist not hate women? How can any man that strangles the life out of a woman, making sure her last moments were filled with terror and suffering, how can they not do this without hatred towards the woman? Professor Oglov, who was an expert witness at the trial, stated that no one truly understands why sexual sadism disorder even develops and they only know that it's an extremely rare condition. And what's even rarer is that a sexual sadist as young as James to kill on his very first attack. It's a sexual interest, a fantasy, but all of that ends when you actually act on it. And I think we don't know if that's his first attack it's what he claims but you know no one had ever come forward but was that really his first attack that violent brutal at the age of 19 a few things were taken into consideration at his trial for his sentencing and that was the sexual sadism disorder the mild autism spectrum disorder and the ADHD and they agreed that it was this sexual sadism disorder that caused him to attack Eurydice, but they also believed that his autism interacted with his disorder and resulted in the offending. So they believed that his autism, the role that it played, made him more fixated in pursuing this violent fantasy. And I think I want to be clear, they never said his autism caused him to attack but they did say it played a role in him being fixated on wanting to carry through with the attack. When asked why he targeted Eurydice, he stated that it was because she was drunk and he wanted to see if she was going to do anything funny. But autopsy results that were carried out on Eurydice showed that she didn't even have a drop of alcohol or any drugs in her system. Later on, James admitted that it was Eurydice's appearance that made her a target. It was appealing to him. That was the look that he liked. The defense asked the court to take into account that James did not plan Eurydice's murder, that yes, he found her appealing, he found her attractive, but he did not decide to harm her until the moment that it happened. However, taking into account his past behavior, the porn he watched, the fact that he stalked her for over an hour, I mean, he had multiple opportunities to back out of this, to change his mind one full hour with this decision to follow her, let alone end up and kill her. The actual attack, how brutal it was. The court was satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that James had actual intention and planned to kill Eurydice. The court said his intent to kill was driven by thoughts, fantasies, and pornography, that he would be a great threat to the community if he was free. Polly, Eurydice's sister, also testified in court and, and stated that James's actions to end his sister's life devastated and ruined her family, that she was now suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder following her sister's death. James was sentenced to life in prison with a 35-year non-parole period. In addition to that, James got 11 years for rape, seven years for attempted rape, and two years for sexual assault. And Unfortunately, he will be serving those concurrently with his life sentence. I wish, how many years, 18, 19, 20. I wish those 20 years were added on to his non-parole period, making that 55 years non-parole, you know, non-parole. He was also placed in protective custody due to him being attacked by other convicts. Now, James's lawyers, James, actually tried to appeal his sentence multiple times because they found it was way too harsh for him. They tried to use his young age, the fact that he admitted his guilt so quickly, how remorseful he was. He had no prior offenses, his autism, and the fact that he had to be placed in protective custody. His appeals were dismissed though, because the judge found his crimes to be unspeakably loathsome and cruel. Polly, Eurydice's sister, says that she lived a really honorable life, that she was gutsy and determined and clever, 
And when I think of her, I feel proud and I feel inspired. And in this way, I'm surviving. Later, a 29-year-old man named Andrew Noltz was arrested after he vandalized Eurydice's memorial in Princess Park just days after her murder. He painted a 25-meter image of penis on it. And he told the media that he wanted to cause media outrage, but he insisted that he didn't mean to hurt the victim. He did it to attack feminism because of the female support Eurydice was receiving and promote his anti-vax message, namely that he believed that vaccines caused autism. He was sentenced to 200 hours of community service and he had to pay back $20,000 to cover the cleanup costs for his vandalizing. The magistrate also ordered him to produce a DNA sample because she considered it in the public's best interest. And now he will be required to participate in men's behavioral therapy as part of his rehabilitation. And he was given a five month jail sentence after he skipped five shifts of community service and he actually traveled overseas. So the judge was just really not happy with him. Eurydice's case is very similar to another huge case in Melbourne, the Jill Mara case. And people have argued that both women, you know, were walking alone at night. They should have been responsible for their safety. And while I agree to some extent, men walking around late at night should be responsible for their dicks. Control your dick, control your brain, control your urges. It still blows my mind that case after case, people walk around this earth believing they can harm someone else, that they have a right to someone else. It's infuriating. Eurydice was literally bothering no one. She made jokes about men and women and inequality and how one day we will be equal. The fact that James literally saw her for a few seconds, she triggered something in him, triggered a fantasy, a fantasy that needed to be fulfilled in that very moment is wild. How many other times did he walk past similar women and didn't act on it? How many potential victims had there been? Eurydice's family already had a hard start to their lives and then midway they lose another family member in another horrific way. <sighs> Prayers to her family, people that knew her. I mean, nothing will ever make them be okay. Let me know your thoughts on this case down below, guys, and I will see you in next week's video. Besitos. Bye.